Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. And for this week's Approaching the Scene, I wanna talk about how for the last, I don't know, gosh, nearly 10 years, I've been using live view focusing on my DSLRs to determine depth of field, to see whether I've got everything that I need in the close foreground in focus and in the background in focus. And in the process, how I nail hyperfocal distance, that focus distance that gets you just reaching out barely to infinity and then stretching that zone of apparent focus back towards you as far as is possible. Uh, and you know, I've been talking about how Nikon's new mirrorless cameras are amazing in just about every way, except that they really limit my ability to do that. And it's like taking away something that I'm used to doing. And, and you know, I want this video series to be really a, a conversation. I want you guys to drive the content. And Gary chimed in and in a comment on the YouTube video about that depth of field problem and said, could you do a video that shows how you do that with your DSLR. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm here in my yard, I'm in between my studio and the house. I've got my Nikon D850 with my Zeiss 35 F2. And I've got the same bunch of Euphorbi that I used in the Please Fix This Nikon video talking about the Z6 and Z7. Got some crows that are chiming in on the video. But I'm gonna record my live view screen on here so that you can see it. I'm, gonna, I'm all the way open right now in manual mode, I'm in a manual focus mode. If you had an autofocus lens, you could just flip your camera to manual focus. This is really a manual focusing issue. You're not gonna use autofocus here. You're gonna get out of manual focus. This is, or out of autofocus. This is for manually focusing to perfection in the field and fine tuning that focus and viewing what the sensor's seeing at final aperture. So I'm here in live view. I'm in manual mode. I've chosen a 500th of a second. I'm at F2 right now. I have auto ISO, so our, so our exposure is gonna stay right. And I have the touch to autofocus system turned on. Even though the autofocus is turned off, it lets me set that autofocus point wherever I want on the screen. And I'm just gonna, gonna touch one of these close euphorbias and zoom in to 100% view. We're just gonna zoom in, boom, so that we can really see how out of focus that is. And then I'm just gonna manually focus until that looks sharp. Now, if you wanted something to stand out in isolation, you know, one thing that I generally do with my DSLR is wear reading glasses. I, I am lucky to have 20-10 vision at distance, but you know, as, I, as I'm getting a little bit older, it's harder to see close up, and I want a nice, good view of that to just get perfect, sharp focus. So there you go, that's focus. Now, when we scroll up on our live view and look at the background, of course, at F2, that's just completely blown out. So here's where I'm gonna back back out, and let's stop this camera down to say, F11. And here we are at F11. We're previewing F11. Uh, if I zoom in, of course, that thing that we just focused, that euphorbia is going to be perfect, but our background isn't. We focused centered up on the euphorbia. So let's, let's move our, our, our focus to hyperfocal distance. Here's our infinity object, our thing that's the furthest away that matters to us. I'm going to just focus further away until it just barely comes into focus right there. And now we can scroll down and you can see we've lost focus on the foreground, even at, even at F11. Let's try F16. So I'll just stop that lens down to a smaller aperture. I'm gonna zoom back into the background. I'm gonna focus a little closer until we start to lose focus. We're starting to kind of lose focus right about there. And scroll down. It's a little bit better it's still just a bit soft. I could say what happens at F22. I just tap to focus up here, and let's go to F22. Zoom all the way into 100%. And we can focus a little bit closer because we've extended that aperture, increased that depth of field. I'm just turning the manual focus ring a little closer till it comes out of focus and then back to where it looks sharp. And then as I scroll down, now we've got a focused foreground. So that technique lets me really nail depth of field. It lets me know that my foreground's in focus, my background's in focus, or it's not even achievable at the focus length with the aperture of lens choices that I have, and I'm gonna need to think about employing something like focus stacking in the landscape. So that's how I use my DSLRs. It was my D850, my D810, my D800, my D750, my D500. 
Uh, all of them did that to perfection. Let me show you why you can't use the Z6 and Z7 to do that. And then I want to answer a question from Greg about how to use split view focusing with the new Z6 and Z7. So I'll be right back with the Z7 on the tripod and the same lens through the FTZ adapter. All right, so I don't want to take too long on this part because I've already done a video about the problem that the Z6 and the Z7 have with depth of field. But I just thought I'd show you, you know, back to back with what I just showed with the D850. I got the Z7 up here, essentially the same sensor and a mirrorless body, amazing viewfinder. Uh, I have the same settings where manual mode, manual focus, 500th of a second, auto ISO. Got that same lens through the FTZ adapter, the Zeiss 35 millimeter F2. I haven't even moved the tripod. We're set in the same position. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing with, with everyone. I've got the touch to focus turned on. I can set my point where I want. I can also, you know, look through this beautiful viewfinder while I do this. And I'm going to zoom into 100%. I have my OK button programmed to zoom into 100%. One of the nice things with this camera is I don't need to use the reading glasses because it's got that spectacular viewfinder that I have a diopter adjustment to view it close up. So I've zoomed in, I've got that, you know, clearly everything's bokeh out in the background. You know, let's, let's zoom back out. Let's try changing apertures. And as you watch what's happening on the LCD, oops, I just changed shutter speed. I'll change apertures. You can see that background is coming closer and closer into focus, just like it did on the 850 from F2 all the way up to F5.6. And then it stops changing. It's locked at f5.6. In, in, a, in a move, I assume the Nikon engineers intended to just help improve autofocus. But again, we're manually focusing here in the landscape, trying to perfect depth of field and find hyperfocal distance. So, okay, you say, you know, I do have a depth of field preview. I can hit this depth of field preview button and get a pretty good, you know, I can see that the background's not in focus. I could try to do my hyperfocal distance move. Well, what happens if I zoom in, you know, let's, let's say we're gonna try F11 like we did before. Let's move our focus point up to that background. We could zoom in, I'm at F11, but it's only showing me F5.6. And if I hit the depth of field preview, it does the depth of field preview, but it flips back to a fit mode. There's no possible way with this camera to preview depth of field zoomed in to 100% at any aperture smaller than f5.6 and it seems like it would be a simple uh, firmware update for the engineers now thankfully because people have been checking in with Nikon calling their representatives calling their sales reps uh, I've checked in with with uh, Nikon professional services both the US and Germany have sent alerts to Japan that this is a problem uh, so you know hopefully they'll fix it in a future firmware you know one question that I had from uh, from from Greg was about how to use the split view focusing with the Z6 and Z7. Well, I'll show you here. Here we go. We're going to do the same thing. We'll go scroll back to F2. And you can put the split view focusing in any spot you want in your eye menu. So I hit the eye menu button on the back of the camera. Up comes my eye menu. And this little icon right here is split view. When I hit it, I can, I can get a view from, you get kind of an idea left and right. If I, if I move up or down, I can sort of scroll around. It doesn't really work. I can touch to choose which one I'm, I'm, I've got activated. The thing is they move up and down simultaneously. It's really a left, right. You can see what's happening is that, you know, you've got a little preview. If I, if I touch, it goes into the inactive window and it lets you focus, but you know, we're at F2 right now. There's sort of the background in focus. And I could stop, I, I can stop down. Let's try that. If we hit the eye menu, we come out of it. Let's try stopping down to F5.6. Oops, we'll go to F5.6. We know it actually stops down to there. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at what this back euphorbia looks like. Zoomed in 100%. That's what it looks like at F5.6. If we use the split view, we could, uh, we could choose that. We still have everything in infinity focus back in the background. Let's have a look at the foreground. There's our foreground at f5.6. Well, let's jump out of there and let's try f11 like we just did. 
if I go into my split view, it's still giving me that same kind of a view. Jump back out. If I go to F16, go into split view, same view. It's not stopping down to F16. You know, if I if I if I uh, take a look at that versus F, let's go to F22 even just to make sure. Same view, didn't change at all. We're still viewing F5.6. So let's let's uh, go back to F5.6 just to to double ensure that that's the accurate truth. Hit the split view. Same view. Yeah. So if if instead I went out of there and chose F2 and we went into split view. Well, now you see it's changed. Everything's gotten a whole lot more blurry in the foreground. So split view is a marginal utility to me if I can't stop down to final aperture to see what's in focus and what's out of focus. So it's a really cool idea, particularly if you had something that's further away on one side of the frame versus the other side of the frame since it's left and right. You know, I think I'm more of a person who just like to scroll up and down, zoomed in at final aperture like I showed with the D850. So I don't know how much utility the split screen has. It's a, it's a cool feature. It's, it's definitely something you can mess around with. Um, but again, you know, I really think that the, uh, that, that the bulk of the problem with these Z cameras is the need to be able to stop down. And the funny thing is, if I flip into video mode, let's just check that out for one second. I'm gonna to have to, uh, it's gonna create a little pause here, but now I'm in video mode. I'm at, uh, I'm gonna go in, open up my, go, oh, I have to go, I'm in a diff different settings here. I'm still at a 50th, I'm at a 50th of a second like I would be for video. Uh, and I'm gonna turn on my auto ISO, which I would never do in video. But, you know, let, let's, let's do this thing where if you, if you take a look at with me here, at f5.6, we zoom in. Let's 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 try our little exercise here. We'll zoom in to 100%, and we can focus it so that the foreground is in focus. And then let's come out of there. I just hit that OK button to zoom into 100%, and let's go up to f16. Well, guess what? That's working. If I pop out of there and go to F18 or F22, things are getting more in focus. If I go back to F5.6, way out of focus. So that just goes to show they've only limited this feature in still mode. I think it's for autofocus. I think it would be as easy to turn off as remapping it the same way it is in video mode or just changing it so that it only works that way when you're in manual focus or even giving us an option in the menu to turn it on and turn it off. Um, so anyhow, that's, that's how I use live view focusing to ascertain hyperfocal distance, depth of field with a DSLR and how I can't do that with the Nikon Z6 and Z7. So let's hope for a firmware update. All right, so before I sign off for this week, I had one more really great question. I love how many questions have been coming in via email, via the YouTube comments section, but I had a great question from my good buddy Dave, who's gonna be in my Olympic National Park workshop with me uh, in August, but said he just, he had to know before, before he got me one-on-one, -on -one, he wanted to know, you know, I advocate in changing light in different situations, running in aperture priority mode, if motion isn't a big concern for you, just to determine depth of field with auto ISO, or in shutter priority mode with auto ISO. And Dave asked, if you're in shutter priority mode, aperture priority mode, or manual mode with auto ISO, how does the camera determine what it's gonna change? How's it manipulating those settings for you? And, you know, I, I'll, I'll just break it down really fast. If you're in aperture priority mode, and you have auto ISO turned on, the camera is gonna change shutter speed slower and slower and slower, keeping your aperture as close to the base number that you've set. You know, so if you have auto ISO turned on at your base ISO, which I'd recommend with some maximum level setting that you've put in the menu, whatever camera you're using, usually you can set a maximum ISO beyond which you don't want ISO to float. Uh, it will lower shutter speed 
to a point that's hand-holdable. And the camera's, the camera's gonna keep track of what focal length you're at, even if you have a zoom lens and you're changing zoom settings, it's gonna know what's hand-holdable, -hold and it's gonna give you a little leeway in that hand-holdability. It won't assume you're using perfect technique. It's also gonna know whether you have a vibration reduction. It's gonna lower that shutter speed down to a hand-holdable speed, and then beyond that, it's gonna start raising ISO to keep the exposure at the proper level that it, that it sets up until the point where it hits that maximum. And then it's just gonna underexpose the image if it can't get a good exposure beyond that. The opposite's true in shutter priority mode. If you're in shutter priority mode with auto ISO, it's gonna open up the aperture in lower light and open it up and open it up till it hits that maximum aperture. Then it's gonna start raising ISO. It's gonna try to keep your ISO at the base to get the highest quality image, least noise, most dynamic range, right up until it can't, and then it will work with ISO. So it's gonna change that. So when you have speed is the most important thing. If you're working with sports, action, wildlife, something where you wanna freeze motion, where you wanna blur motion, you set that shutter speed, it's gonna float aperture as much as it can than ISO. If you're in manual mode and you set auto ISO, it won't change your shutter speed or your aperture at all. Those are locked in, sacrosanct. Those settings are yours. You've set them. It's just going to move out of ISO around up until the ceiling until just to try to get the exposure right. So that's how those three things work. It was a great question, Dave. Uh, and you know, speaking of questions, make sure that you guys no question's a dumb question. The only dumb question is the unasked one. So drop them in the comments section here on YouTube. Uh, put them in the, uh, into an email. I'm easy to get. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. It's a ton of fun to produce these, and I'll see you next week.